A lone kayaker paddles in the still waters off the coast when suddenly a massive hammerhead shark circles beneath. Without warning, the predator lunges, knocking the kayaker into the ocean. Struggling to stay afloat, the kayaker watches in horror as the shark comes back for another strike. What happens next is a fight for survival that you won't want to miss. On September 16, 2024, the U.S. Navy vessel USS Archon was gliding through the cold waters of the North Atlantic. The ship was conducting routine patrols about 300 miles off the coast of Nova Scotia, Canada, an area known for its unpredictable weather and its dense population of great white sharks. The vessel's crew, led by Commander Ethan Graves, had grown accustomed to the rhythm of these patrols. Long hours of monitoring the radar, scanning for submarines, and maintaining the vessel and the day had started like any other. With the crew quietly going about their duties, unaware of the terror lurking beneath the waves. At around noon, the waters had grown eerily calm, a marked change from the usual choppy conditions in this region. The temperature had dropped noticeably as well, something that had caught the crew's attention. Yet nothing seemed particularly out of the ordinary. Commander Graves, a seasoned officer in his early 50s with decades of naval experience, stood at the bridge, reviewing reports and occasionally glancing out at the gray waters. The ocean stretched endlessly in all directions, and there was no sign of activity on the surface. Beneath those waters, however, something large and powerful was approaching. The North Atlantic was a known hunting ground for great white sharks, especially in the late summer and early fall when seals migrated through the region. These sharks could grow to incredible sizes, often reaching over 20 feet in length. They were apex predators, feared for their power and unpredictability. But none of the crew aboard the Archon could have anticipated what was about to happen. Just after lunch, as the crew carried on with their routines, a sudden jolt shook the ship. At first, everyone assumed it was a mechanical issue, a malfunction in the engine or perhaps the ship striking a submerged object. But the tremor felt too forceful too unnatural. Alarms began to blare as the vessel tilted slightly, sending men scrambling to check for damages. That's when the lookout, stationed at the front of the vessel, spotted something in the water. A dorsal fin, a massive, unmistakable dorsal fin, was slicing through the surface of the water, heading directly for the ship. Before anyone could react, the creature launched itself out of the water in a powerful breach, slamming its full weight against the hull with a thunderous impact. It was a great white shark, but unlike any the crew had ever seen before. This one was enormous, at least 25 feet long, its body covered in scars from years of battles in the wild. The shark's sheer size and force knocked several crew members off balance as the ship swayed from the impact. Commander Graves rushed to the bridge, barking orders for damage control, but it quickly became clear that the situation was dire. The shark struck again this time ramming its snout into the ship's stern, denting the steel plating and causing the ship to take on water. The vessel, though built for combat and durability, was no match for the relentless power of the creature attacking it. The crew scrambled to initiate emergency repairs, working quickly to patch the damage as water began flooding into the lower decks. The great white circled the ship, its dark shadow visible beneath the surface. It moved with terrifying purpose as though it was hunting the vessel itself. Sharks were known to breach boats, but never with this level of aggression. The crew was on edge, watching the water with growing dread. The shark breached again, this time closer to the bow, its jaws snapping at the air as it came crashing down against the hull. Metal groaned and screeched as the shark's massive body collided with the ship again and again. Inside the ship, panic was beginning to set in. The damage to the hull was extensive, and the repairs were not holding as well as they had hoped. Several compartments had already been sealed off to prevent further flooding, but the situation was growing more dangerous by the minute. Commander Graves ordered the crew to abandon non-essential areas of the ship and focus all efforts on keeping the vessel afloat. They worked with frantic energy, the constant fear of another attack driving them forward. As the shark circled back for yet another strike, the crew in the engine room heard a deep, resonant thud. The force of the shark's impact had caused one of the main generators to short out, cutting power to parts of the ship. Lights flickered, and the vessel slowed to a crawl as engineers struggled to get the systems back online. Above deck, the crew was now fully aware of the scale of the threat. 
The great white shark was acting with a level of aggression and persistence they had never encountered before. Commander Graves kept his eyes fixed on the water, his mind racing with possibilities. Sharks were opportunistic feeders, driven by instinct and hunger. But this attack felt different. It was more deliberate, almost like the shark was reacting to some unseen force. He thought back to recent briefings about the changing conditions in the ocean. Rising temperatures, depleting fish stocks, and shifts in migration patterns were causing disruptions in marine ecosystems all over the world. Could these environmental changes be affecting shark behavior? Was this great white lashing out because its natural food sources were dwindling? The shark attacked again, breaching high out of the water and slamming down onto the deck of the ship. The impact was so severe that it crushed part of the railing and sent debris flying. Several crew members were knocked to the ground by the force of the blow, and the shark's enormous body thrashed violently before sliding back into the water. The boat rocked dangerously, its balance compromised by the repeated strikes. As the crew worked to stabilize the vessel, they noticed something even more unsettling. Sharks were gathering around the ship. Smaller sharks, perhaps drawn by the noise and disturbance, were circling the area, their dorsal fins breaking the surface. The Great White continued its assault, undeterred by the ship's defenses. Every few minutes it would breach again, striking the vessel with terrifying precision as if it were determined to sink it. The crew fought to keep the ship afloat, patching the damage as quickly as possible. But the shark showed no signs of relenting. The water around the ship was churning with activity as the predators closed in. Commander Graves knew they had little time left. The crew needed to find a way to deter the shark before the ship was irreparably damaged. They activated sonar pulses designed to repel large marine life, hoping it would be enough to drive the Great White away. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the shark began to retreat. The sonar pulses seemed to disrupt its behavior, causing it to swim off into the deep, followed by the smaller sharks. The water grew still again, but the damage had been done. The USS Archon was severely compromised, its hull was battered, and the relentless attack shook the crew. As the ship limped back toward the coast for repairs, Commander Graves couldn't shake the thought that something was changing in the ocean. The attack wasn't just a random encounter, it was a sign of a larger shift. Environmental changes were driving these predators to new extremes, and the balance between humans and the ocean's apex predators was becoming dangerously fragile. The heat wave of 2024 had gripped the Chesapeake Bay for weeks, pushing temperatures to record highs. By mid-July, the waters had warmed to levels that were nearly unheard of for the area. Normally, the Chesapeake Bay was home to crabs, oysters, and fish, with the occasional shark passing through during migration. But this year was different. The rising water temperatures had driven bull sharks, known for their aggression and ability to survive in both salt and fresh water, farther into the bay than anyone could remember. On July 23rd, John Latimer, a 55-year-old local fisherman, set out early in the morning from his small dock near the fictional coastal town of Point Barrow, Virginia. Like many others in the area, John had grown up on the bay, spending his days fishing its waters for blue crabs and stripers. Fishing was his livelihood, but it was also his escape. That morning, despite the stifling heat, John was determined to get out on the water before the sun became unbearable. He had heard rumors of increased shark sightings, but didn't think much of them. Bull sharks had been seen before, but they never caused much trouble. As John motored out into the bay, the stillness of the water struck him. The heat wave had driven many people away from the beaches, and the bay seemed emptier than usual. He cast his lines and waited, watching the horizon for any signs of movement. A few crabs and small fish nibbled at his bait, but nothing significant took hold. The hours passed slowly, and the heat became oppressive. John wiped the sweat from his brow, considering heading back in. He was about to pull up his lines when something heavy tugged on one of them. The sudden force nearly pulled the rod from his hands. John quickly tightened his grip, bracing himself against the side of his small boat. Whatever was on the other end of the line was massive, far larger than anything he had hooked before. His mind raced with excitement. Perhaps he had finally hooked a trophy fish. He started to reel it in, but the creature on the other end was fighting back, thrashing beneath the water's surface. Then, out of nowhere, 
the water around his boat erupted. A large gray shape surfaced, much larger than any fish he had ever seen. John's heart skipped a beat when he realized what it was. A bull shark, easily eight feet long, was fighting against the line, its powerful body churning the water as it struggled. John had seen sharks before, but never this close, never this aggressive. The shark wasn't trying to escape, it was charging toward the boat. Before John could react, the shark lunged, slamming its body against the side of the boat with such force that the entire vessel rocked violently. He lost his footing and fell backward, hitting the deck hard. The boat tilted dangerously to one side as the shark continued to thrash, its tail slicing through the water with terrifying power. John scrambled to his feet, heart pounding as he tried to regain control of the situation. The bull shark was relentless. It rammed the boat again, its jaws snapping at the side of the vessel, tearing into the wooden planks with shocking ease. John grabbed for a nearby pole, desperate to fend off the shark, but the creature seemed unfazed. With each hit, the boat took on more water. The situation was rapidly spiraling out of control, and John knew he needed to act fast if he wanted to survive. In a frantic attempt to save himself, John reached for his knife and cut the line that had hooked the shark. For a brief moment, the shark paused as if confused by the sudden lack of resistance, but it didn't retreat. Instead, it circled the boat, eyeing its prey with cold, calculating focus. John's boat was now damaged and sinking slowly. He knew he had to make it to shore, but the shark wasn't going to let him go easily. The shark struck again, this time hitting the boat so hard that John was thrown into the water. Panic surged through him as he splashed into the bay, his arms flailing as he tried to stay afloat. He could feel the water moving around him, the presence of the shark close by. His heart raced as he swam desperately toward the sinking boat, hoping to pull himself back on board. But the bull shark was faster. John felt something brush against his leg, a cold, rough touch that sent chills down his spine. Then without warning, the shark struck. Its jaws clamped down on John's leg, the force of the bite sending a shockwave of pain through his body. He screamed, thrashing wildly as the shark dragged him beneath the water. Blood clouded the water around him, and for a moment John thought this was the end. But in a desperate act of survival, he kicked with his free leg, striking the shark's head repeatedly. The shark loosened its grip just enough for John to break free, and he swam with everything he had back to the boat. Grabbing the side of the boat, John hauled himself out of the water, his leg bleeding heavily. The shark circled below, waiting for another chance to strike, but John didn't give it the opportunity. With one last burst of energy, he started the engine and steered the damaged boat toward the shore. The boat limped through the water, slowly leaving the shark behind. As John neared the safety of the docks, the bull shark finally disappeared, sinking back into the depths of the bay. John's attack was the first, but it wouldn't be the last. Over the next several days, more bull sharks were spotted in the Chesapeake Bay, their presence drawing the attention of marine biologists and local authorities. The heat wave had driven the sharks closer to shore their normal hunting grounds disrupted by the rising water temperatures. The normally peaceful bay had become a feeding ground for these aggressive predators, and the community was on edge. Marine biologists, including Dr. Sarah Delaney from the Chesapeake Marine Institute, began tracking the shark's movements, hoping to understand what had caused the sudden surge in sightings. The warming waters caused by the prolonged heat wave were altering the shark's behavior pushing them into areas where they had rarely been seen before. Dr. Delaney and her team worked closely with local authorities to implement safety measures, closing beaches and advising fishermen to stay out of the water until the sharks moved on. As the summer wore on, the sharks remained a persistent threat, their presence a stark reminder of the delicate balance between humans and the natural world. The heat wave eventually subsided, and the bull sharks began to retreat, returning to deeper waters. On the morning of August 5, 2021, the commercial fishing fleet based out of Chatham, Massachusetts, set out for a routine day of work off the coast of Cape Cod. The fleet, led by Captain Ron Walsh of the Silver Marlin, had been fishing these waters for decades. Cape Cod was famous for its abundant marine life, and the summer season was always prime for fishing. The boats targeted tuna, haddock, and swordfish, using heavy baited lines that often brought in impressive catches. 
But this year, things had felt different. There had been rumors of increased shark activity in the area, particularly sightings of mako sharks, fast, powerful predators known for their speed and aggressive nature. The fishermen were cautious, but no one was prepared for what was about to unfold. Ron Walsh had seen his fair share of sharks over the years. At 48, he was experienced and level-headed, running a tight operation with his crew. That morning, the weather was fair and the sea was calm as the fleet reached their fishing grounds about 20 miles offshore. Ron and his crew set about their tasks, dropping lines and setting bait. The radio crackled with chatter from the other boats in the fleet, all reporting good conditions and a steady start to the day. By noon, the catch was coming in strong. The crew of the Silver Marlin worked efficiently, pulling in line after line of tuna, their coolers quickly filling. But as they hauled in their nets, something began to feel off. The water around the boat started to churn with unusual intensity, and small fish scattered frantically, fleeing from an unseen threat. Ron noticed the change and immediately thought of the sharks. The first mako appeared just as the crew was pulling in a particularly large tuna. The sleek, torpedo-shaped body of the shark darted toward the boat at incredible speed, drawn by the scent of the bait and the thrashing fish. Ron yelled for his crew to pull the lines in faster, but the shark was already too close. With a sudden burst of speed, the mako lunged at the tuna, its jaws snapping shut around the fish just as it was being lifted out of the water. The crew watched in shock as the shark tore the tuna in half, sending a spray of blood and water across the deck. Panic rippled through the fleet as more mako sharks appeared, drawn by the commotion. The sleek predators began circling the boats, their eyes locked on the fishermen and their catch. The crew scrambled to pull in the remaining lines, but the sharks were relentless. One of the Makos charged the side of the Silver Marlin, its powerful body slamming into the hull with a force that rattled the entire boat. Several crew members lost their balance, stumbling as the shark circled back for another hit. Meanwhile, across the fleet, other boats were facing the same crisis. The Makos were targeting the baited lines and the fish caught on them, leaping out of the water to snatch their prey directly from the hooks. The fishermen tried to fend them off with poles and gaffs, but the sharks were too fast, darting in and out of range with terrifying precision. One of the smaller boats in the fleet, the Blue Runner, was struck by a particularly large Mako, which tore through the side of the vessel, damaging its engine and leaving the boat dead in the water. On the Silver Marlin, things were getting worse. Another shark had latched onto one of the lines, pulling with such force that it threatened to drag a crew member overboard. Ron and another crewman rushed to help, cutting the line before the shark could do any more damage. But the sharks were becoming more aggressive, their feeding frenzy spiraling out of control. One of the crew, a young deckhand named Eric, was struck by a shark's thrashing tail, sending him sprawling across the deck. He lay there, dazed and bleeding from a gash on his head as the sharks continued their assault. Ron knew they couldn't keep this up. The sharks were relentless, and the fleet was suffering severe damage. He called out on the radio, urging the other boats to start pulling in their lines and retreat to safer waters. But the Makos were everywhere now, and the crew's attempts to drive them away were failing. Several boats reported damage to their hulls and equipment, with crew members injured from the shark's violent attacks. As the fleet tried to regroup, marine biologists from a nearby research vessel, led by Dr. Nora Caldwell, arrived to assess the situation. They had been tracking the movements of the Mako sharks in the area for weeks, studying their behavior and migration patterns. Dr. Caldwell was alarmed by the reports coming in from the fishing fleet. She knew Makos could be aggressive when provoked, but the level of aggression the fishermen were describing was unprecedented. After contacting Ron and the other captains, Dr. Caldwell suggested a strategy to help mitigate the attacks. The Makos were being drawn in by the scent of the fish and the vibrations caused by the boat's engines and equipment. To deter them, she advised the fleet to deploy acoustic devices that emitted a high-pitched sound known to repel sharks. It wasn't a guaranteed solution, but it was the only non-lethal option available to help the fishermen protect their boats and themselves. The fleet quickly set to work deploying the devices, attaching them to the sides of their boats and along their lines. The effect was almost immediate. The sharks, disoriented by the sound, began to retreat, their frenzied movements slowing as they moved away from the boats. 
Within an hour, the attacks had ceased, and the Makos had dispersed into deeper waters. The day had been disastrous for the fleet. Several boats had sustained heavy damage, and the fishing operations had been severely disrupted. Ron and the other captains knew they were facing a difficult season ahead. The Makos were still out there, and there was no telling when they might return. The cost of the damaged equipment and lost catch weighed heavily on their minds. Still, they also understood that the sharks were not the enemy. They were part of the ecosystem that had been pushed to the brink by overfishing and environmental changes. The marine research vessel Oceanic Dawn rocked gently in the warm waters off the Bahamas. It was May 3, 2018, and the research team had been at sea for over a week, studying the migration patterns of hammerhead sharks. This part of the Bahamas, near the fictional island of Clearwater Cay, was a well-known hotspot for the elusive creatures. Hammerheads, with their unique, wide-set eyes and flat, hammer-shaped heads, were fascinating to marine biologists due to their mysterious behavior and wide-ranging migrations. Dr. Lydia Foster, the lead researcher, had dedicated much of her career to understanding these predators and was eager to collect data better to protect them from threats like overfishing and habitat loss. That day had started like any other. The team had prepared their equipment early, setting up their sonar arrays and tagging devices. Dr. Foster worked alongside her assistants, Rachel Moreno and Marcus Hale, as they coordinated the drones that would track the shark's movements. The day had been productive, with a few hammerheads already tagged and swimming off into the deep blue. Morale was high as the team monitored the live feeds, watching the graceful predators glide through the water below. But as the afternoon wore on, something changed. The team's equipment began to pick up erratic movements from one of the sharks. One hammerhead in particular, much larger than the others they had encountered, had started circling the boat, staying closer than usual. Hammerheads were curious creatures, often inspecting boats and divers with their keen senses. But this one seemed different. Its movements were sharper and more aggressive, as if it were marking the vessel as an intruder in its territory. Dr. Foster adjusted the drone cameras to get a better look at the shark. It was huge, easily over 13 feet long, its wide hammerhead unmistakable on the screen. The shark was moving with an intensity that made the team uneasy. Marcus noted that it had circled the boat at least six times in the last half hour, which was unusual for hammerheads, who typically passed by quickly and moved on. Then, without warning, the shark made its first strike. The boat jolted violently as the hammerhead rammed into the side with incredible force. The team was thrown off balance, scrambling to stabilize themselves as the boat rocked in the water. Rachel grabbed onto a railing, her heart racing as she tried to steady her breathing. Marcus rushed to check the equipment, fearing the impact might have damaged their delicate sonar arrays. Dr. Foster watched the water, her mind racing to understand the shark's behavior. The hammerhead returned, this time ramming directly into the drone cage that had been lowered into the water. The impact was hard enough to knock the cage sideways, tangling the cables that connected it to the boat. The shark thrashed violently, its tail slamming against the side of the vessel. It wasn't just curious anymore, it was angry. The research team had encountered aggressive sharks before, but this level of hostility was rare for hammerheads, which were generally more cautious around humans. Dr. Foster knew they had to act quickly. If the shark continued its attack, it could cause serious damage to the boat and the equipment, not to mention putting the team's lives at risk. She instructed Rachel and Marcus to reel in the drone cage, but the cables were stuck, tangled in the shark's relentless movements. The team worked together, struggling against the tension on the lines as the shark rammed the boat again, harder this time. The force was so strong that part of the boat's railing bent inward. Marcus, closest to the edge, nearly lost his footing as the shark slammed into the boat once more. He steadied himself just in time, narrowly avoiding being thrown into the water. His mind raced with the thought of what might happen if he ended up overboard with the aggressive predator circling below. He tightened his grip on the cable, his muscles straining as he helped Rachel pull the cage back up. The shark's attacks intensified. It circled the boat again, this time closer, its wide, flat head grazing the hull as it moved with frightening speed. 
The team worked frantically to untangle the cables, but the shark wasn't giving them any time. It struck again, hitting the boat with such force that water splashed over the sides, drenching the deck. Dr. Foster could feel the tension rising. The shark wasn't acting like a typical hammerhead. It was defending its territory, and they were right in the middle of it. At that moment, Dr. Foster made a quick decision. She instructed Marcus to activate a sonar pulse designed to disrupt shark sensory systems in emergencies. It was a non-lethal deterrent, but powerful enough to disorient the shark and hopefully drive it away. Marcus hesitated for a second, then hit the switch. The pulse emitted a high-frequency sound that traveled through the water, designed to confuse the shark's electroreception. The hammerhead reacted almost immediately. It thrashed in the water, circling wildly before darting off into the depths. The boat stilled, and for a few moments the team was left standing in silence, hearts pounding in their chests. They watched the water carefully, waiting to see if the shark would return. But the danger seemed to have passed. Slowly, they began to relax, their bodies still tense from the encounter. The damage to the boat was significant, with bent railings and damaged equipment, but the team was unharmed. Dr. Foster, though shaken, was already thinking ahead. The incident had been a reminder of the unpredictable nature of fieldwork in shark-inhabited waters. The sharks they studied were powerful and territorial, and the ocean was their domain. Respecting that balance was crucial not only for their safety, but also for the success of their research. As the sun began to set, the oceanic dawn headed back to Clearwater K. The team remained quiet, reflecting on the close call they had just experienced. Dr. Foster knew there would be more challenges ahead. But she also understood that these moments were part of the work. The Hammerheads were not the enemy. They were creatures with their own needs and instincts. On July 18, 2015, the Florida Keys were buzzing with excitement. It was the day of the annual high-speed jet ski race off the coast of Marathon, a small town known for its stunning waters and vibrant marine life. Spectators had lined the shore, cheering as racers from across the country prepared to compete in one of the most thrilling water events in the region. Among them was Jake Carter, a seasoned racer who had been training for months. The weather was perfect, and the waters looked calm, ideal conditions for the competition. By mid-morning, the race had started. Jet skis roared across the water, sending up waves as racers weaved through the course's buoys. The participants were focused, adrenaline pumping as they pushed their machines to the limit, reaching speeds of up to 60 miles per hour. The atmosphere was electric, with the sound of engines mixing with the excited cheers from the crowd. Jake was in the zone, staying neck and neck with the race leader, eyes on the finish line. But beneath the surface, something was amiss. The waters off the Florida Keys were known to be home to a variety of sharks, including blacktip sharks, which were common in these waters. Typically, blacktips were not aggressive toward humans unless provoked. However, the commotion from the race, churning water, the loud motors, and the constant vibrations, was drawing the sharks closer to the action. As the racers rounded one of the final buoys, disaster struck. A large blacktip shark, agitated by the activity, became entangled in one of the floating buoys used to mark the course. Thrashing violently in an attempt to free itself, the shark collided with the jet skis speeding by. The first racer to encounter the shark was thrown off his machine as the shark's powerful tail struck him across the chest. The impact sent him sprawling into the water, dazed and bleeding from a gash on his shoulder. Jake, unaware of the chaos unfolding ahead, sped toward the same area. He saw the splash and the racer struggling to stay afloat, but didn't realize the danger beneath the water until it was too late. The black tip shark, still frantic, lunged upward, its teeth grazing Jake's leg as it surged past him. The sharp pain shot through Jake's body as he lost control of his jet ski, tumbling into the water just feet away from the injured shark. Panic erupted among the other racers as they saw the shark thrashing and the injured men in the water. Spectators on the shore screamed in alarm. Their cheers turned to cries of fear as the realization of the shark's presence spread. The race organizers, stationed in boats along the course, quickly called for an emergency halt to the event, signaling the racers to retreat to safety. But the shark, still caught in the buoy line, continued its aggressive behavior. Two more racers, trying to steer clear of the chaos, 
were knocked off their jet skis as the shark thrashed wildly. One of them, a woman named Kelly Harper, felt the shark's body brush against her as she struggled to stay above water, her life vest the only thing keeping her afloat. Her leg was bruised and bloodied from the impact, but she managed to swim toward one of the rescue boats that had sped toward the scene. The rescue crews moved swiftly, pulling the injured racers from the water as the blacktip shark finally broke free from the buoy. The shark, disoriented and stressed, swam away from the scene, leaving behind a trail of blood and confusion. On shore, paramedics rushed to treat the injured participants. The shark's teeth had deeply cut Jake's leg, and another racer had suffered a concussion from the force of being thrown off his jet ski. The race was officially called off, and the atmosphere shifted from excitement to tension as everyone processed what had just happened. Local marine authorities, along with experts from a nearby Marine Biology Institute, were called in to investigate the incident. Black tip sharks, while normally not a serious threat to humans, had been known to become aggressive when stressed or agitated. The commotion of the high-speed race had likely disturbed the shark's natural behavior, causing it to act out aggressively. As the day wore on, event organizers met with the marine experts to discuss the incident and the measures that needed to be taken to prevent future occurrences. There had been a growing concern in the community about the increasing interaction between marine life and human activities, especially in areas like the Florida Keys, where tourism and water sports were common. The event exposed the delicate balance between adrenaline-fueled sports and the need to protect the marine environment. The race's cancellation was a blow to the participants and the organizers, but safety was the priority. The injuries, though painful, were not life-threatening, and all the racers were expected to recover. Jake, lying on a stretcher with his leg bandaged, reflected on the experience with a mix of fear and relief. He had been in dangerous situations before, but nothing compared to the raw power of the shark that had come so close to ending his race, and possibly his life. In the weeks that followed, local authorities worked with marine experts to develop new safety protocols for future water events. They implemented stricter guidelines for race courses in shark-populated waters, including monitoring systems that could detect large marine animals in the area before events began. The incident sparked a broader conversation about the intersection of human recreation and wildlife conservation with many calling for more awareness of the impact that high-energy activities could have on marine life, emphasizing the need for preventive measures in popular water activities. The remote waters off the coast of the Aleutian Islands, Alaska, had always been known for their isolation and unpredictable dangers. On September 12, 2010, the crew of the Northern Wind, a commercial fishing vessel, set out for another week-long expedition. Captain Finn Harrison, a weathered fisherman in his mid-forties, had been navigating these treacherous waters for years. His crew joined him. Nick Wheeler, a strong and steady deckhand in his thirties, and Joel Perez, a young, eager fisherman with just a few years of experience under his belt. They were miles away from any land, fishing in the frigid, deep waters known to yield valuable catches like halibut and cod. The day had started normally enough, the crew worked in unison, hauling in their nets filled with fish, the deck of the northern wind slick with seawater and the smell of fresh catch. The weather had been holding steady, though a cold wind was beginning to pick up, a sign that rougher conditions were likely ahead. Captain Harrison kept his eye on the horizon, watching the skies darken, but he was used to the unpredictability of the Alaskan waters. By midday, the crew had collected a large haul, filling the ship's hold with enough fish to make the trip worthwhile. Joel, standing at the stern, threw another line into the water while Nick secured the latest batch of fish. As the boat rocked with the waves, none of them noticed the shadow moving beneath the surface. That shadow belonged to a dusky shark. Dusky sharks were not common in these waters, but with the warming seas caused by melting polar ice, their migration patterns had started to shift. Typically found in warmer regions, this predator had been drawn north by changes in the environment, bringing it closer to human activity, and now it had picked up on the scent of the fish bleeding into the water from the northern wind. Suddenly the boat lurched. A loud thud echoed from the hull, sending Nick stumbling backward. Joel, who was still holding the line, 
felt an intense tug far stronger than any fish could manage. He barely had time to react before the line snapped, whipping past his face. The crew's attention quickly shifted to the water, where a large fin sliced through the surface. The dusky shark, agitated by the presence of the boat and its catch, charged the vessel again. It struck with immense force, shaking the entire boat. The impact sent a chill through the crew as they realized the shark wasn't just curious, it was attacking. Captain Harrison rushed to the controls, trying to maneuver the boat away, but the shark continued its assault, ramming the hull repeatedly. The blows were strong enough to knock loose some of the equipment secured on deck. Panic set in as the crew scrambled to assess the damage. The shark, persistent and aggressive, circled back, charging once more. This time, it targeted the fishing net still hanging off the side of the boat. Its sharp teeth tore into the nets, ripping through the lines as it tried to reach the fish trapped within. The violent thrashing caused several of the fish to spill back into the water, but it did nothing to deter the shark. Joel, trying to secure the remaining gear, was thrown off balance as the shark's powerful body collided with the side of the boat. He fell hard onto the deck, his hands scraped and bleeding. Nick rushed over to help him up, his heart racing as the shark continued its assault. Captain Harrison, seeing the growing danger, ordered them to cut the remaining lines and retreat. With the shark circling dangerously close, Nick and Joel grabbed their knives and cut the last of the nets free. But the damage had been done. The shark, still hungry and agitated, wasn't letting up. It breached the water, its massive body half emerging as it slammed back down, sending another wave of force through the boat. Captain Harrison knew they couldn't stay here. The boat had already taken too much damage, and the worsening weather was now closing in fast. The crew worked quickly to secure what was left of their gear, but just as they were about to pull away, the shark struck again, this time biting down on one of the steel cables attached to the fishing gear. The force of the bite caused the cable to snap, whipping across the deck and narrowly missing Nick's head. He ducked just in time, his heart pounding in his chest. Captain Harrison managed to get the engines running at full speed, steering the boat away from the shark. The vessel powered through the waves as the predator, finally deterred by the distance and the lack of fish, began to fade into the depths. But the damage was done. The crew, shaken and bruised, gathered on deck, taking stock of what had just happened. As the northern wind made its way back towards safer waters, Captain Harrison couldn't shake the implications of the encounter. The dusky shark wasn't supposed to be here this far north, this aggressive. It was a sign of the changing climate, the melting polar ice driving predators like this into new territories. The isolation of their work had always been dangerous, but now, with the shifting behavior of marine predators, it felt even more uncertain. The crew had survived the attack, but it served as a harsh reminder of the unpredictable power of nature. The waters they fished were changing, and so were the creatures within them. As the northern wind limped back to port, Captain Harrison knew that future expeditions would carry even greater risks, as the balance between man and the ocean continued to shift in ways no one could predict.